So this is the flash simulation that illustrates orbit. It's kind of fun. Um, I wanted to show you this workaround so that you can run it for yourself and kind of play with it. Uh, this is the kind of the typical sun and a planet orbit. Uh, I guess you can imagine this is Mercury. It's kind of slightly elliptical. Uh, I think this is a little more elliptical than Mercury's orbit. Um, and, and this illustrates uh, Kepler's first law. And, um, and you can get what Kepler's first law says that planets orbit the sun in elliptical uh, path with the sun at the center of, sun at one of the two foci. This is one of the two focuses. There's another focus of ellipse here that you know, there's just nothing there. So, so it illustrates Kepler's first law. To drive that mathematically is a little bit um, challenging <laughs> because uh, uh, you have to be good at vector calculus. And there are some textbooks out there that'll do that derivation. If uh, someone's interested, let me know. I can find the textbook and point you to it. Um, and this is, is really Newton's uh, greatest, um, most significant contribution in the whole uh, discussion, whole, I guess, uh, debate or discovery of what kind of laws, law of gravity is. Because a lot of people other than Newton have uh, theorized it might be an inverse square law, but I guess only Newton was good enough at calculus to actually work out that uh, Kepler's laws were known, uh, Kepler's from a uh, generation before Newton. So Kepler's laws of orbital motion were known at Newton's time and Newton could derive Kepler's first law by assuming that gravity is inverse square um, law of force and using his uh, uh, the Newton's laws of motion, the force of produces acceleration and all that. So you can play with you know other presets like sun, planet, moon. These are fun. <laughs> so I'll just leave that for you to play with. What I want to end. Oh, oh this is a fun one uh, where if you watch it for a bit, you will see something interesting happen. So what they label as a planet, they give it a little bit of, yeah, <laughs> planets have a, a Mass number two, it has a little bit of mass. So as it swings near a comet, it'll affect it gravitationally. That's why orbit of the comet kind of keeps changing over time. And this is uh, one of the fun presets that are set in a way that kind of demonstrates how uh, comets can get knocked out of their orbit by a uh, close by pass of the planet. Um, here, it'll slow it further down and make it swing in. That's fun. <laughs> but what I want you to get to was uh, kind of the things that you don't see in nature. I mean, you know, you can pick up things um, where they are kind of similar. So you can imagine um, this closer inner thing is maybe one of the uh, terrestrial planets, Mars. And this might be one of the uh, comets that are on a somewhat elliptical orbit, but not too far out. And this would be another comet that's also in an elliptical orbit that's uh, farther out. And um, this setup illustrates Kepler's second law of planetary motion, which is that, let me just stop them briefly, that, um, so you can imagine looking at one of them and tracking motion of a single comet over its uh, orbit. You see that when it's farther out, they move at a certain speed that's slower than the speed that they move, like it zoomed by this portion really fast. And, and that illustrates Kepler's second law because you can imagine kind of um, setting this up. So using something like, I don't know, a half a second as your duration of time. So here's the, Here's the area swept by um, line connecting the sun and the planet over that half a second. I'm just gonna click start and then stop as quickly as I can. That's gonna be close to half a second. So that's the area swept out by the line connecting sun and the planet. It's a thin slice of thing, not drawing straight lines very well. And when it's closer, okay, around the here, I'm gonna again do the same thing. Click start and as quickly as I can, click stop. That's gonna be close enough to half a second. 
you can see that because it moved uh, farther, um, it, if this, even though this radius is less, uh, when you look at this area and um, compare that to this area, they should be the same. And that's what Kepler was able to figure out from, um, from the record of the orbit of Mars. And uh, after figuring out his first law, he, <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, so that's Kepler's second law. And the claim that I made in the lecture is that this Kepler second law can be, uh, it, it can be derived from con uh, conservation of uh, angular momentum. And in this setup, uh, it might not immediately look like angular momentum is conserved because when you see this planet out here, it's uh, moving pretty slow. And when you look at the planet in here, it's moving pretty fast. So um, how is angular momentum conserved? Well, it's conserved because when you consider these distances, are uh, at aphelion and consider the distance are at perihelion, then the angular momentum in terms of the rotational inertia times angular velocity, the rotational inertia, it depends on the distance. So for a pointness like that, rotational inertia is the, the distance from the center squared times the mass of the thing. So when it's an aphelion, it's uh, uh, radius, radius is larger. So this rotation inertia is going to be greater. So that requires this angular velocity be less uh, in order for angular momentum to be uh, the same when it's at this point and it's at this point. And in fact, that is omega, um, smaller proportionally, omega is a smaller inverse proportional to like inverse square. So that if you are, instead of tracking this in terms of omega, if you are writing this in terms of the tangential velocity divided by r, then one of these r's canceled out by one and your uh, the tangential speed will be inversely proportional to the distance. So, so that's one way of looking at how in this situation where you see the speed of the orbiting objects change, that that's consistent with the angular momentum conservation. But, um, but maybe you are puzzled by my assertion that um, angular momentum is conserved in this setup that clearly has external force. This sun here, it's a body that's external to this planet. It's clearly exerting this force of gravity that's going to be equal to, you know, what's given by Newton's law of universal gravitation. So given this external force, why should the angular momentum be conserved? And this is because gravity is a central force, meaning gravity is in the exact direction that I have drawn. It goes, of, um, it acts on this body, pointing in the direction towards this center where it's uh, coming from. And when you look at the expression for torque, torque is the displacement vector cross product with the force or in a um, kind of less vector-like language, you can think of it as the lever arm times the force. Here, the displacement vector is the vector from the sun pointing to here. This is my R. So when you take cross product of this vector with this vector, that's gonna be zero because the, 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 they are at 180 degrees and this cross product will be zero. Or another way to put it is uh, level arm is the perpendicular compon component of displacement and um, perpendicular to the force. And with the force pointed that way, here the perpendicular component is zero. So throughout the entire orbit of this planet, there's no point at which uh, level arm is not zero. So even though there is an external force on it, there is no external torque on it. 
that's why uh, the angular momenta should be conserved. So, so yeah, it uh, um, so the relationship that you have from Kepler's second law, it, you can um, connect it directly to angular momentum conservation, and uh, and this is the <laughs> illustration of that. So.